thank you everyone for coming. I'm excited to moderate uh, what promises to be a really interesting discussion between our four panelists today for uh, this iteration of Stories from the Field in Silicon Valley. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to let each of the panelists introduce themselves to the audience, sort of in their own words. And I guess I'll just ask, I'm sure everyone's read the bios that are in the program, um, but if you could just remind us of your institutional affiliation, your field, and maybe what you're doing now so we can put a face to the language we have in the program um, and just kind of get this conversation rolling. Um, I appreciate if we could keep these introductions to about a minute and a half tops, uh, but feel free to, after you've reminded us um, of where you fit into the world, if you'd like to say any words about um, being here or, or Mayday or anything that strikes you with respect to this conversation, please feel free as long as it's within about a minute and a half. So we have plenty of ample time for a question and answer period at the end and also for the discussion um, that, that we'll have today. So, I'm Tama Nakar. Um, I got my degree at Berkeley in um, the Italian Studies program with a designated emphasis in the Film Studies program, which is a lot of words for saying I did popular Italian cinema from a cultural studies perspective. Um, and hopefully, yeah, you've read my bio, so I don't go into a lot of detail, but uh, I've always been a tech geek, so for me, it was sort of this natural possibility to explore sort of my tech side, which worked out really nicely for me, and right now I do what's called developer experience, uh, which is dealing with customers who are developers and knowing how to work with them in a very specific way. Um, actually, I I took your mic uh, the, the, green, the green light's on. Can you hear me? Test, test, test. Yeah, that's to get a little closer. Yeah, this is as high as I can. Can you hear me better? Or I can just hold it. Um, so with that, I actually took some notes because this is actually something I'm quite passionate about, um, working with a lot of people in the communities who are thinking about different things. So uh, feel free to link in with me and um, you know, we can talk about it more beyond what can be covered in this panel. Uh, my name, my mic's working. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Christian Blood. My PhD is from UC Santa Cruz in literature, and in my past life, I worked primarily on uh, the intersection of second century North African Roman prose fiction and contemporary transgender studies. Uh, I left my job, and I now work at Zoho Corporation, which is a cloud-based software company. Uh, I don't do much on Roman literature there. Instead, I... <laughs> I was hired to do corporate education. We've got an office in Chennai with about 5,000 employees, and in a way I teach freshman comp there, but I've also moved into HR, and my role is mainly to figure out how we can find, recruit, and retain uh, high-quality tech writers in South India. Say goodbye, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dana. My name is my name is Dana DiPietro. I uh, <laughs> I did my PhD in uh, Near Eastern Archaeology at uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, since that time, I've uh, worn many different hats. Uh, I did my, my dissertation on uh, Late Bronze Age ritual uh, and interactions between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Um, found that there wasn't a huge job market, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but ended up transitioning into cultural resource management. And so now I uh, work with a company uh, called First Carbon Solutions during cultural resource management uh, uh, under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, I split my time also uh, running a nonprofit organization called SHARE, which is the Society for Humanitarian Archaeological Research and Exploration, which is a long name, but has a, a nice tight little acronym. Um, and um, yeah, I was able to transition into two of those uh, two of those uh, careers that I, I didn't envision I'd be able to. Uh, at the time when I was going through my PhD, uh, but was very happy to end up there, um, and uh, very happy to be here with all of you, uh, all of you today. So um, I came out of UC Davis out of the Native American Studies Department, um, and I have a firm now called Indigenous Consulting Services, and in essence, I'm doing precisely what I wanted to do. 
um, as I was leaving graduate school. I went in with a very specific purpose to do language revitalization in Native communities, and that's what I do. <laughs> Great, thank you all so much. So I'll start with my first question, um, and like any academic, a lot of my questions have multiple questions. Um, so please feel free to pick one and kind of speak to whichever um, speaks to your own experience, uh, and don't feel any pressure to answer them all. Um, but the first one has to do with labor, which we've been discussing at length um, at this humanist at work. And, is how did your PhD change the way that you perform and approach labor, intellectual or otherwise? And upon completion, what kind of work sounded appealing to you? And what kind of work was out of the question, um, if any? Are we doing in order? Um, and I, I prefer to just keep it organic. Um, so if anyone would like to say. I'll just share that, uh, so I never shut down my academic side. I still write and publish and go to conferences. And it's, um, we talked about how, you know, I ended up in a PhD program because I always had questions and I wanted them answered. And that part of me never changes just because uh, my day job. Tense, tense, tense. Um, test, test, test. I'll, I'll just project and wave back there if you can't hear me. Um, so currently, actually, my book project that I'm working on is the history of career women in film and television, which was sort of, you know, came about from other projects I was doing. And um, So I think actually a lot about labor and being in the industry. I also think a lot about, you know, the 78 cents that every woman makes for every man's dollar and how... Um, you know, that's always front and center. How I know that I'm culturally impacted, um, which they say, you know, being raised a girl is an ethnicity, where there are certain things like, you know, I want to be rewarded for the work that I put in. I shouldn't have to fight for promotions and et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that you have to. And so it gives me strength to know that when I do fight for that, it's not for me, it's for all the women that I know who, you know, are just trying to raise that to be as equal as possible. So um, so those are just thoughts that are um, in my mind that come from you know the research that I do as well as my day job, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think in terms of um, the way that we go about conceptualizing work, I, I think it was my experience and, and in talking to many of you um, last night, um, I think it's a common experience that uh, as we progress as we progress through, uh, you know, through our, our, our studies as graduate students and then move on to our professional careers as academics, um, it, there's a narrowing that happens in terms of our, our conception of ourselves and the kind of work that we can do and the applications of that kind of work. Um, and I don't think I, I, I was able to really think of myself as, as being able to do anything other than the standard tenure track line. And as I sort of realized that that's not what I necessarily wanted to do, um, and that's a really scary realization when you have put you know like nine years into a PhD and you're like, oh my god, uh, even if I get this job, do I even want it? Um, it, it was really uh, something that was that was very eye-opening to realize that those skills, the uh, research skills, the, um, the 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 fundamental you know critical thinking, the, the way that uh, all of the training that we go through is, is widely applicable across, uh, across the spectrum, but, but even more important than that, uh, that, that there were avenues to pursue the interests outside of the academy that mattered to me, um, and, and, and to find a fulfilling career, uh, I think just to echo what you said earlier, uh, to, to actually end up doing what you, what you wanted to do in the first place, even though it's outside of the bounds of maybe where you thought you would end up. I don't know, does this work? Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of, so I, my, my, I guess, um, kind of how I functioned and didn't function is a little bit different. Um, so I was awarded my degree. I went home and thought, what am I going to do now? Because I never wanted to be an instructor at a university. I'm a lover of research. I love research. I love giving that research, the knowledge that's gained to people. I really dislike writing it up. 
<laughs> so what that leaves you with is, you know, publish or perish, you don't really fit in, right? Um, and I'm not one to like um, kind of lay down and die, so I wasn't going to perish. <laughs> but the way this kind of worked for me is that I went home, I got a phone call that said, would you like a consulting job? And I said, sure. Don't know what that means. It sort of turned out to be with the state of California in health services um, and doing work or doing write ups so that doctors and medical professionals could work in Native communities um, with some sort of cultural understanding in California. And then I got done with that and I went home and got another phone call about three months later that said, Would you like a postdoc? And I said, Sure. <laughs> So I went to the postdoc. I know this sounds odd, but this is the way it happened. Okay? I wasn't running around putting in applications any place. Um, and so I left the postdoc after its 18 months and got another phone call that said, would you like to come teach in the department? Um, because I don't, didn't just teach language. So, you know, one thing about NAS, Native American Studies, it's multidisciplinary. So I could teach political science, I could teach tribal administration, um, I taught history, um, I taught the language courses, because you had to be well-rounded in what has happened to Native people in, on this continent, right? So that was my background, um, and then I have another background. When I walked into the university, I was running a nonprofit, um, which also included an art gallery, so my first degree was studio art not in languages, not in NES, right? So I have this kind of broad field. So anyway, I taught at the university, then started applying for tenure track positions, and I wasn't getting them. And I wasn't willing to leave home. Um, I went into the university as a much older student. Uh, my children and grandchildren were living in the house that I grew up in, and I wasn't leaving home. So I either was gonna get a university job, which was UC Davis was the only university close to the house, <laughs> within 40 miles. I apologize for that. Or um, go up and work at the Dairy Queen. We pay 12.95 an hour. And I was raised in a culture that work is work. You know, you're not above anything. You're not below anything. You just bring home what you need to bring home. Does this work better? <laughs> Can I just talk really, really loud? Yeah, I'm, got, I'm sorry, this one's got battery problems. Okay. Okay. It's a little, okay. We'll find the right position for it. Okay, so I, I'm almost done with this. I'm almost done with the story, so everybody else can get on board here. Um, and uh, I didn't get the tenure track job that I had wanted, so I just packed it up. I mean, I literally packed up my office after six years, um, which was boxes and boxes and boxes and lots of shredding. You have to shred all that stuff that your students leave. <laughs> um, and I remember the chairman saying, well, what are, you, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm leaving. I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> and he was like, why? And I said, well, I didn't get what I wanted. So I'm going to leave. Um, and he couldn't understand that. Because academics, you're, just, you're supposed to just sit there and grind it out, right? No matter how painful, no matter how awful, no matter you're, you sit in that chair and you do what's asked of you. Um, and after serving on people's qualifying committees and serving on committee, you know, uh, on uh, you know Davis committees, I was I was done. And tribes had been offering me contracts for a few years, and I wouldn't take them. So I took them. 
Um, but I had my business cards made up since 2006. So I walked out the door knowing that that really wasn't my place. And um, I'm where I'm at now, and I'm really happy with it. And I have to say that when you have your own business, especially in this economy, it can be an uncertain future. Uh, but if you stay in the present and the work that you have in front of you today and what is um, needs to be presented to your clients tomorrow, then the worry's not there. You just keep doing what you love and you end up in the spot that is good. Uh, I don't want to sound totally contrarian or pugilistic, but I, I find it totally unconvincing to hear anyone from the academy talk about fair labor. Uh, if we think about the exploited labor of graduate students, the crisis with adjuncts, and even for the people who are lucky, the tenure track, oh, tenure track, I was tenure track. I thought it was, uh, and I had a very good job, and I was in another country, and my university had a ton of money, and I had brilliant students, and I taught two classes a semester, and I got four months off a year. And it was miserable, because the, the <laughs> uh, like all of us, until you have your book, what the hell else are you doing? You can't enjoy anything you're doing until you have your book, and uh, women especially, but women and men are asked to delay starting families. Uh, if you're married or partnered, what your spouse, your spouse is expected to sacrifice themselves to your academic career. And from what I can gather, no one particularly enjoys it. Uh, you know, after I decided to leave, I gave my last conference paper at my uh, field's annual convention, and we were in San Francisco, like the most fun city in the world. 3,000 brilliant people, and everyone was having a terrible time. <laughs> and, and I felt like no one's actually, like, I wanted to talk about Opuleus with somebody, but no one's talking about Opuleus, they're talking about so-and-so's recent article. And everyone's posturing, and everyone, except for the 12 people at the top of this pyramid scheme who are having a great time, <laughs> everyone else is miserable. And I, I don't know if there's anyone else on the tenure track, but in graduate school, how many people sleep well? How many people are on antidepressants? How many people are in therapy? Uh, you know, and I, I that, that's you know not unique to the, the academy, but I think that uh, it's really not a mystery until we stop accepting so many graduate students. There's not a crisis in hiring; it's just supply and demand. Um, and you know, if you're one of the people who's lucky enough to get one of the three tenure track jobs in your field, you're still. S I, I thought getting tenured would solve the problems. Uh, just as I thought getting married would solve my problems, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> and what I found is it was replaced by an entirely new set of problems. And I loved teaching, and I thought I was a very good teacher, uh, won all the awards. But the fact that every moment of my day belonged to my research agenda, I found totally uh, misery-making. Other people thrive in that. Great. Uh, but it was very easy for me to leave because uh, I didn't think my own research was worth sacrificing my life to. And in a way, that's what it felt like. The amount of the demands that were placed on all of my physical and mental energy in order to produce and please Reader A and Reader B. Uh, I actually think that, so the, you know, I, I, should, I want to make clear that the firm I work for in Silicon Valley, we're not Google. We're not Amazon, we do not burn money. We have, uh, we're actually a very thrifty company and I'm not paid insanely well and we're publicly, or privately held so I don't have stock options. I just wanna make that clear. I didn't completely sell out to buy a Tesla or anything. But you know, it's, when I'm at work, I work and I'm expected to be at work. And when I go home, I'm done with work. If I want to work, I do. But I don't wake up every Saturday morning that like, am I going to write and be unhappy, or am I going to not write, take a me day, and be unhappy? <laughs> <laughs> the time is mine, I'm compensated for my time, and when I decide, because I'm an adult, that I put in enough for the day, I'm done. And so, again, I understand how it happens, but I find it unconvincing for people in the academy to fret too much about fair working conditions 
and good treatment of labor, since all of us, myself included, are enabling the system that allows for exploitation uh, at every level. Not to be too deep or like buzzkill, but uh, <laughs> I, I think that the answer to improving the labor conditions in the university is to leave it and uh, get rid of the glutted supply of readily exploitable labor. Thanks. I wanted to add to that. Because, um, so, as a, you know, I do spend my me time still researching <laughs> and sitting in archives and a lot, but it's, no one's making me do it, right? Um, and so I still see my old friends at conferences and um, whether you choose to stay within the academy um, or uh, to pursue something else, what I've noticed is, um, yes, people sticking around, being miserable, and it's really getting them down. And so here I am in my little Silicon Valley world, and I'm always a problem solver, so we're talking, and I come up with innovative ideas that maybe they could get better funding for their departments or their students. But there's so so many of them, not all of them, but so many of them are so, um, their morale is so low, and they're so negative, and they're, at this point, you know, very bitter. and. Um, you know, one of the things I felt was literally, neurologically, if you let that take over and you don't have other outlets for that, you know, you lose your ability to be creative with your own life and to think of ways that you can, you know, improve things. And um, for me, one of the most important things about being in any part of academia, especially in the humanities, is that we cannot forget that we live in a world of ideas, right? This is why we're here, because we, are curious and we look for information and that we're innovative in the way that we understand the world and that and hopefully days like this we help each other to translate that innovation that we have into other areas right like whether it's how you um, translate that onto your resume or how you can apply that into your workplace uh, whether it's within your department or whether it should go elsewhere so you know i really hope that I, I do try to help my friends and i know that their lives are so difficult and they've decided to stay in academia but um you know that's the value that we bring and, and that's the value that you know i feel i'm compensated for in, in my tech job um and so with that too innovation doesn't mean you have to go out and be an entrepreneur in tech or whatever i mean one of the best things I did was go into my first tech job and notice that processes were completely either broken or non-existent, and it was actually kind of joyful to improve something that impacted hundreds of people in my company, and they were so thankful and they you know, recognized it a lot. And In fact, I've worked in companies where we get these interns, these undergraduates, and we're so careful about making sure that we give them these special projects so that they don't feel exploited and, and that they can go and report back on what they did at the end of the internship. And I literally told them, I said, I'm going to give you this project that on paper looks interesting, but I feel like um, you're missing out on an opportunity by, because a lot of times if you're smart enough and you're innovative enough and you're giving grunt work, you'll see processes that are broken. And if you are you know, have initiative, you can fix them. And you, know, you bring that to it and everybody recognizes that it's extremely satisfying. So, you know, the world of ideas that we live in and how we can apply them in different places is, is so varied and, and there's so many opportunities. Um, and then, of course, as I said, you know, to stay positive in whatever ways you can or to make life decisions so that you can be positive, so that you can um, really thrive that part that makes you special, which is, you know, your creativity. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I know that a lot of folks feel exploited, right, as graduate students. And it happens in a lot of places. Um, but for me, that wasn't what happened. And I know that it's rare, but I want to tell you that you can seek and make a shift. Um, so for the first two years, I was given a basically a two-year contract um, as a researcher for one of the linguistic institutes. Um, and then I became an instructor. So not a TA, an instructor, right? You can do things and, and I'm saying that those boundaries that they're putting in front of you and saying this is the way it's done, you don't want to ignore them. You want to look at them, as she was saying, and say, this doesn't work or it doesn't work for me. 
maybe I'll allow it to work for everybody else, but I'm not willing to make it work this way. And so push the boundary. See what happens. What are they going to do? Make you be a TA again? I mean, really, that, that's the worst case scenario, right? <laughs> I, I actually just wanted to chat in too because after after you know receiving my degree, I've been a TA for well, I did the full twelve semesters that you're allowed to do. Well, no, I mean, and, and then I went into lecturing right after that and found out that my, my GSI was making more than I was in the lectures. I mean, because because of right, we unionized and you know, the UAW and all the good work that they do and again it's made it so. We really are appreciative of what they do. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that, that I just wanted to, um, to yeah, to, to absolutely agree that um, you know, making it work for you, realizing what your limits are, and really figuring out what it is about the work that you've done um, that energizes you. And if you find yourself being pulled into a different direction, follow that and figure out why. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are on the market and are, are on Academic Jobs Wiki, which uh, is, is probably one of the most depressing websites uh, in, in human <laughs> existence, right? Um, you know, all of these, these articles that uh, you know, are moaning the state of the academy and the lack of jobs that you see your anonymous uh, competitors commenting on, on, uh, on, on, on job placements at specific positions. Um, I did find a gem in there, uh, which really, during my time on the market, I found to be uh, really so helpful and instructive. And, and the, I forget I should be able to cite it, but um, the, the commenters just was essentially, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about all the work that we did in graduate school, and we spent all this time and all this energy and all this effort to get to a point where now we want to get a job. And now I can't get a job. And how terrible is that? And I just all this time. Um, just this article was, no, it's, it's completely opposite, right? We, we got into this because we loved the research, we loved the teaching, we loved some aspect of it. We loved the intellectual pursuit and, and asking the questions. And now we want to get a job so we can continue doing that, right? And it resituates the power, it makes us you know, agents. And that also opens up the opportunity that and you don't necessarily an academic job to continue those pursuits to, to find the meaning in, in what you initially started and all that training comes to bear and, and all of it is worthwhile so I just put a positive spin uh, you know being a TA is the best job, job training for outside the academy I think uh, everything you need to learn about for if you leave academia and go into business or industry or whatever you learn it all when you're a TA. The trick is being able to articulate what you've learned in your cover letter for non-academic hiring committees. So that's tough, and hopefully we'll get to that. Yeah. But uh, God, being a TA is great in terms of you just learn so much shit, and <laughs> there's really uh, you really do stand out when you get if you leave the academy and you go to a job. You can tell the majority of people didn't TA, and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, off of that, that you um, are taking some notes to talk about it more in depth, but you learn to manage up, you learn to manage laterally, and you learn to manage down, right? And, and you have leadership skills. Um, and to add to sort of the decisions that you make, so in my case, part of my trying out a world of outside of academia, it was just an experiment that turned out really well, was uh, I knew that I am social, and that I you know, would want to try to work with teams, and after doing the dissertation for years and living in a dark archive and then living in my house just writing and you know I, I call it the dark period where my friends my friends got married and they had kids and like they were just within a mile of, from me but I was just sitting there writing right and then it was after that that well, I like literally have spent the last years catching up with people oh yeah you got married well you know um, so you know that about yourself you know that's a quality that you translate outside of academia, but if you also know that, you know, some of my friends who are in academia, they like being alone a lot. <laughs> That's not me. Um, but that too, like we're in Silicon Valley, we're just filled with introverts who a lot of times it's like they like being given really hard problems to solve and, and you know, they're the right managers and managers will, will go and set them up to excel at that. So 
um, you know, know yourself and know where you can fit in. And then um, the final part of that too is if you do enter the outside world, you know, I got really lucky um, and I chose really well my very first company that I worked for and I, just, I fit in immediately and I, I got along really well with my coworkers. Um, and if I had chosen something else, I might have had this whole different, oh, Silicon Valley is X and I didn't fit in and all that, right? So Silicon Valley is a million things, a million different people, a million different companies and teams and cultures. So I really say that, you know, um, whether it's in tech or another industry, like if you go in and you feel immediately that you don't fit, it's okay to try to find another job. And it's actually okay to find another job after that until you do because, um, you know, I've worked in teams where I had great fit, I've worked in teams where I didn't. Um, and I stuck out both to a certain extent. It was really, um, you know, a valuable experience. But I do think now, having done that, that if I ever have another job where, like, literally from day one or the first couple months, I'm thinking, I'm just not a right fit for this team, then, you know, I'm very comfortable just moving on and then finding a team where, you know, we can uh, work together. Really So just one thing to think about before she uh, poses the, the next set of questions um, is that what else have you done because, why you've been a student? I mean, most people, they work, they do the classwork, they do the, right, they do the conferences, right, they do all that, but how are you involved in your community on your campus? What are you doing on that campus? Are you doing any sort of committee work? Are you involved in any, any activism that's going on on campus? This is what, anywhere from four to nine years of your life? Mm -hmm. And you, like was being spoken earlier, you're supposed, you know, the idea is that we're whole human beings. We're not just our brains, right? And we have passion and we have concerns and we want to change some aspect of the world. And you have an opportunity now, sitting in whatever institution that you're at, to do precisely. So I spent a year in administration working for the dean. That let me see what you can do at a university level, right? So if you're sitting there, oh, I'm just a student. No, you're not just a student. Can I say? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent point, and if you're in grad school and you have the opportunity to be the rep for your that sits in on the faculty meetings, do that. Or uh, I did that, and it was, it was fantastic, and it's really how I discovered that I was really interested in HR, because uh, I sat on the committee. We did two tenure track hires one year. I sat on the committee that read all grad student applications, and I did the uh, external review, which I love. I couldn't figure out why the faculty hated the external review. It was fascinating, and it's because it's about process. So that we finally had the opportunity to talk about the way things work and the way we do things, to see how optional it is, and it could be different. And so, do those sorts of things. It might take time away from your research, but you will find, you may find, something else that you love doing and you're good at that you didn't know about. Great, I think that's a perfect segue to my next question, which has to do with community, which is something we've been talking a lot about at Humanists at Work, and um, something I've heard as a thread throughout uh, kind of everyone's career, whether it's the native community, the community of the wine shop that you talked about with me, Dana, um, building kind of maybe transnational community across Korea, India, um, the Christian stem, or with the students. Um, your new crop of freshman comp students, um, or hiring a team, um, or being social in general as a whole person. Um, so what role does community play in your work? And sort of to give us some context, and some of us who are still graduate students and wondering how to build community um, on campus, what role did it play for you in graduate school? And is there kind of a linkage between that you can identify? Um, or how have you approached community from your time as a PhD student to, to where you are now? I can take that. I think it's a, nice, a, a really great segue. As we, we talk about the community that we have within the academy, um, you know, with our colleagues, with um, our broader colleagues, but as humanists, uh, by nature, right, our community is 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 
multifaceted and extends beyond the academy, right? We're engaging with uh, the arts, we're engaging with cultures, we're engaging with ideas, and uh, and by nature, um, you know, those communities, the source communities where we're doing our work, um, are are critical and they're part of that conversation. Um, and too often, I think they can be completely bifurcated. Um, in my experience, I, I you know was in a program where I, I really felt I had to keep my nose to the grindstone and any discussion of doing something that remotely hinted uh, uh, activism or you know the kind of pejorative terms that are put to anything that wasn't sitting in writing my dissertation, um, you know was was roundly discouraged. Um, so I found myself doing my graduate research on a on a grant uh, living in Israel and finding that I had a topic that didn't work with protests going on outside uh, while I sat looking at late Bronze Age pottery uh, that all of four people care about. You know, I, mean, to those, I mean, there are more than four people. And it's an interesting thing, trust me. I, you know. but, um, but, but I think I was really, um, at that point, very aware of the fact that I was in an insular bubble and was really working within a very small sort of context. And I, I, I just personally had a desire to be doing something that's engaging with that that broader community um, and and working with stakeholders and working with um, you know the the actual places that we were in and um, archaeology can can also be a very sort of when you're on an excavation uh, and there are some archaeologists here that can speak to this I think um, you know you can you're, you're you're working on a dig site you're working from four o'clock in the morning to you know um, about five at night and uh, you don't have a real chance to engage uh, by nature of the work. So that said, you had students coming who were in the midst of the Israeli-Palestinian you know, conflict, and two or three years in, having no idea actually of the substantive issues that were, you know, going on around them. And um, anyway, so that, that led into an opportunity to actually uh, expand and have some of these conversations, and uh, and once more actively engage the stakeholders and see if there was a way that you know because these narratives about the past, how we go about constructing the past, are so. Critical to um, you know to to what's happening in terms of the conflict. Um, can we turn that on its head? Can we can we actually use archaeology as a way to engage these things? So as of about five years ago, we started bringing students together. Now we work with high school students, um, Israelis and Palestinians, West Bank, um, Arab Israeli Palestinians, um, uh, and uh, in, in their communities, and and that's been a really fulfilling way that has been outside of the traditional course of the academia through the non. Nonprofit track, and it's something that wasn't welcomed uh, by way of the published and perished paradigm, right? That time wasn't supported or rewarded because there were different priorities. Um, that said, you know, um, you know, it, it, it required going outside those bounds, and so um, I think that um, that was kind of my my experience of, of um, needing to to go that route in order to. Answer those questions of, of, and, and engage with the community uh, in a way that I, I really felt I needed to. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think you live in a lot of different communities at the same time, or at least I do. Right? So, and I have to say, within NAS, one of the things that's taught. Of course, many of the students coming into NAS are um, native, but many are not. Um, but they're, so culturally, if you're native, community is everything. Um, it is, you, you do what's needed for the people around you more often than you take care of yourself, right? Um, and that doesn't mean you exclude from taking care of yourself, but the elders are taken care of, the children are taken care of, and so that kind of thought process actually was in the department because the faculty were Native people from their communities who had earned their doctorates and you know, decided whether they were a historian or an archaeologist or uh, literature, an anthropologist, linguist. They came together to form this new discipline as of about 40 years ago that became Native American Studies or American Indian Studies depending on the university that you're at. So that sense of community was there. And as a student, they encouraged you to be out in a community working, right? 
So then you've got that community that you're working in. You've got the community of NAS within the, the institution, but then you've got the institutional community that you really, I encourage everybody, as Christian said, find a way to participate in in some way. All of you have graduate student associations. You can sit on, you know, um, you, can, you can sit on that as a political head if you want to, or you can just be a member and see what's going on. Um, so I think we have a lot of different communities depending on where we come from. And being active and supportive in all of those is important, again, for being a well-rounded person. Um, but also it's about being of service, right? They encourage you to be in a, a service at, at an institution. You're supposed to be sitting here and sitting there. Um, and you can get overburdened if you don't take care of yourself. But if you are thoughtful about where you're being of service, and it's some, something that really concerns you that you want to see change, then you're affecting change in the world, right? And it might be slow, but um, it adds to who you are as a person, right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer in service, um, and so I uh, donate my time a week or two weeks at a time um, with no pay. I, so I do Breath of Life, and, and I know there's a couple linguists that have heard of that in the room, but basically, um, you go in, I go in as a mentor, and I work with often people I've never met before for a week. Um, one week's at UC Berkeley, and the two weeks is in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. And so this year I'll go to the Smithsonian. And, you know, they'll pay for my plane ride, um, and they give me a place to sleep, and that's it. Right? But that's enough, because what you're doing is giving to other people that otherwise would not have what you have to offer and you all have something to offer them. So where can you be of service? I wanted to add to that. Um, so part of community and networking is, right, you get your job from people you know. It, we're social creatures, networks, LinkedIn, all of that's very important. So um, creating your networks and creating your communities and valuing them, whether they're in academia or in other places, you know, they'll often lead to that surprise first job or surprise opportunity. So, you know, hopefully you have communities that are meaningful, um, but on top of that, there are values um, that come with that. Um, and then I'll, I'll also add that, you know, with that, um, so I actually live in a great community. Um, I live in a co-housing community. Um, what I do in developer experience is I build developer communities. I literally get paid to build communities. And, and community means, as was mentioned, you know, means so many different things in different contexts. Um, so the core tenets for me and what I build is that it's a place where you find support, and it's a place where you have safety, and it's you know, a place where you can share and get help. And um, I have communities among you know, all my academic friends and then um, from my workplaces and, and all that. And um, one thing that helped me being away from academia for a while, at least in tech, there are certain cultures that um, value being less hierarchical, right? As, 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 as flat as possible. So that's actually helped me to go back to my academic communities and be less shy and be less, um, afraid of the hierarchy and just go to someone who's famous and just say, hey, I'm, I'm writing an article and I was reading you know, your book and I thought it was really interesting. Would you be willing to chat or to mentor me or you know, to just give some guidance? And um, uh, that's something that I've taken away that I feel like if I'd stayed in academia, I would, you know, your advisors always tell you like, oh, your advisors are always your advisors. Even when you're a tenured professor and you meet your advisor at a conference, right? All those, all those nerves kind of kick in and you know, um, a lot of times that relationship never goes away. So um, I feel like you know, if that's something that you can apply in your lives, I, I felt it was really useful. Um, also, I, like I said, I get a paycheck to build communities. And at one point, I was doing that so much that um, my writing was getting a little stagnant. And um, there's a group that I was talking about called Academic Ladder Writing. Um, and it's, it's a paid group, but um, it's online. And you know, when I decided whether 
um, maybe I'm okay just walking away from my academic writing, or um, maybe I should revisit again. You know, I thought about that and I joined it, and that's now another like academic writing um, support group that I have, and, and it's really helped me. And um, and part of that was like I called up my old friend, I'm like, oh, where was that group you joined when we were in grad school? And, you know, I quit after my first three months. Like, uh, you were in that a little bit longer, and she said. I would not have tenure, I would not have finished my book if it hadn't been for that group. I am still in that group, you know, 10, 12 years later. I said, oh wow, you know, so, you know, you find these these different areas where, where you can find support and, you know, try not to be shy about mentorship and, um, you know, take advantage of that. And that's what community is supposed to be about, is, is to feel that you have a place where you belong and, and, and people understand you, they understand what you're going through, um, and then you can help each other. There's academic ladder too. Oh. Uh, you know, maybe not with community, but going on finding things and opportunities that you enjoy. Uh, my college in South Korea, I taught at an all English honors liberal arts college in a university in Seoul, South Korea. All the faculty were shipped over from the US. It was it was really interesting. But we did most of our most of our students were Korean, but we did all of our outreach in East and Southeast Asia and Europe. And because I like talking and because I like flying, I was regularly called on to do PR work. And I found myself very often flying with very little notice to college fairs in Jakarta or Bangalore or Johor Bahru, which is just across the border from Singapore, Singapore, Brisbane, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, I never had the visa to do China, but I also did Vietnam, Thailand. and. You know, I'm sure we all intellectually appreciate the amount of privilege we have if we have a graduate degree from the University of California, and if many of us grew up in the United States, the extraordinary privilege that comes with that. But when you go to uh, schools in rural Vietnam, and you meet with students, and you say, hey, you know, we're not Harvard, but our tuition is $5,000 a year instead of $50,000 a year. Let me help you on, with your application. Your English is great. You're very sharp. We could perhaps do this. Uh, and I found that to be, on the one hand, it's really crass. You're doing PR for a, essentially a for-profit enterprise. Most universities are. But uh, on the other hand, to go to a corner of the world that is largely not on the radar of the United States, and because of the way our tuition is structured, the education that we're famous for, is simply not accessible to most students who are living outside the United States. But if you go somewhere and you say, I know how the scholarships work, I'm on the admissions committee, let's talk. I found that to be the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And it's also quite eye-opening when you see parts of the world that at least were not on my radar in rural Vietnam or Johor Bahru have schools that are so extraordinary and uh, such vibrant parts of the world with such smart kids. I mean, these were, again, sorry for being so cynical, but they were far better than most of the undergraduates I ever had at the University of California. Uh, to see that there's this huge world out there, and our little, you know, the United States is a large country, but there's so much more. And that's what I found is that how much is going on out there that I would never have been able to see if I didn't volunteer to be on the committee to do this thing that most people didn't want to do because it took away from your book time. Thank you so much. I have one more question and then I think we're going to open it up to the Q&A period. And so I feel like I, I've heard a lot about um, walking away, whether it's from the academy, whether it's from a position that maybe no longer is challenging you, whether it's country. I'm really interested in sort of that process, but I want to also kind of articulate a question that's specific to it with respect to your, your work. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, Tama, Tama O and I were talking about this a little bit in the car on the way over here. And I think that we in the humanities have a tendency to maybe underestimate our, our worth or our value um, as employees, um, as people, sometimes as whole people. And so I'm wondering how, how you've come to realize or, or articulate your worth um, as an employee or the worth of your labor, and I'm especially thinking of women in, in this context, how have you um, negotiated on behalf of that worth? Uh, 
I think um, as a graduate student, I uh, it was kind of a slow process, and, and forget the word, this process of indoctrination. Um, this feeling of um, your worth in these kinds of contexts really does get to be defined in a really insular way. Um, and, and, and before going into graduate school, I, I, I actually was a, uh, a pretty open and kind of uh, gregarious and, uh, and, and, uh, and friendly person, and found myself very quickly uh, <laughs> a little bit bookish and a little bit, um, no, I, I, I think, um, I, I, I think that, uh, that, that the experience of, 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 of you know, being in these sorts of uh, into the ways, I, I found that, that my, my sense of self became completely, you know, it became completely about what about 3,000 people at a conference thought of me. And, uh, or the five that were reading the paper. Or the five that were reading the paper, and there's <laughs> one of whom actually knows what maybe, maybe what you're talking about. Um, and and it, it, it just seems so natural, too. I think, I think we find ourselves um, in an echo chamber uh, where our colleagues in our departments are going to do the same thing, where we're competing against them, we're judging ourselves against them, and what, you know, their relationship with our shared advisor is like, and how is that going to play out, and what are we going to do, and then that's not even approaching the existential angst of what comes next, right? Um, you know, with this life cycle of spending all of our time getting up to all of the exams, uh, regardless of, you know, what they are in each of our respective disciplines, it's like climbing a mountain. And then finally you get to the top of that mountain and then you're told, okay, welcome to the top of the mountain. Now cross this desert, yes. you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, be sure to bring enough water. <laughs> See you on the other side if you make it. You know, and, 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 and you're, 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 you're left to your own. And, and there are some really valuable lessons there. And there are some extremely valuable lessons. It's, it's a worthwhile process. It's something that is, is necessary. But um, I, I, I distinctly remember you know, having colleagues who along the way found that this path wasn't for them, and they realized they wanted something else, and they would leave. And the internal discussion and the narrative would be, oh, so-and-so couldn't cut it, and they left, right? And oh, yeah, well, we're all the survivors, and we're gonna keep plugging on, where the truth is now looking back, and oh, well, that's somebody who really knew what it is they wanted. Um, so, so to, to the question of, of, of value and self worth, that was something that I think only um, it was a lesson learned later, um, and uh, and one that uh, that certainly I, I, I hoped that you know if, if I had that opportunity to have these kinds of conversations earlier on and had resources to be able to talk about alternatives and to be talking about these kinds of questions, I, I would have realized that yeah, you know, all these uh, you know the the, the my value as a person is not intrinsically tied to uh, how well my paper was received. All right, I'm gonna go to my list. So, uh, I feel like this, these are the things that should be on every person's resume. I feel maybe one doesn't qualify for you, but really, anybody in this room, I think can put a lot of these items on their resume, which is so often on many, many job descriptions, is one. You're a clear communicator. You can write and you can speak, you can use language, and that's a given, and that should be on everyone's resume. Uh, you're a self-starter. If you've been through a PhD program, you are motivated, you have goals, you create your task list, you meet deadlines, right? Um, that's on almost every job description. Um, you're able to think analytically, you're a problem solver. I mean, that's what we do every day, right? That's so often on so many job descriptions and you totally qualify. Um, you're able to keep focus in ambiguous management situations, right? <laughs> Most of our professors have never had management training. Being in business, I strongly believe that they should all have management training. Yes. Some should also have public speaking training. Um, and you have leadership skills, as we were talking about, right? You learn how to manage up, laterally, and down um, as a teacher, as a grad student. Um, and you're a quick learner, right? You have to learn things quickly. So those are my five main tenets, and if you want to drill down a little bit more, I'm looking at it. So the communication, right? So even when you're writing emails, I, I still think it's funny today that sometimes 
you know, someone will be on an email thread and they'll just send me a quick note, like, oh, that's a good email. Uh, because you're constantly dealing with different your executives or, um, you know, different people in management or, or people reporting to you. And, you know, we've all been skilled, right? We can quickly change tone. We understand audience. We understand if we need to be different or if we're negotiating or if we're very appreciative, right? We're able to construct words quickly and we're able to sculpt grammatically correct emails. Um, and we're able to document what it is that we do, if that's what it is, right? And those are such basic skills that we can see, right? Um, and then in terms of being a um, soft starter, like I said, you know, probably a lot of people are organized. You know how to prioritize the things that need to get done. Um, if you find out that your research is going in a different direction, you have to rethink, you have to reprioritize, right? That's all happening in a lot of business situations that are very valued. Um, and then, of course, thinking um, analytically, as I mentioned earlier, being creative, being innovative, um, being able to be an entrepreneurial, if that's the case, being able to fix processes, if that's the case, right? Um, and then in terms of uh, leadership, um, depending on what you're interested in, you know, a lot of times, higher you up in the management chain, the more you're able to, you are required to make decisions. And we are required to make decisions with, in, um, ineffective or uh, imperfect or not incomplete information, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to do risk management, project management, you have to be able to make decisions about your sentence or your chapter or your book, um, whatever it is, right? And those all apply. And then finally, the quick learner part, um, you fake it till you make it. So um, I was sharing recently that I'm both in tech and I'm still in academia, so I'm always um, having my uh, imposter syndrome, and I've come to a point where I completely embrace my imposter syndrome because um, if I don't have it, then I'm not putting my, like, myself in a place where I'm learning and growing and, and feeling pressurized just a little bit, right? So I've come to the place where it's just like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll just quickly learn it, and that, that's really important too. So I think, you know, also the gender thing, you know, talk about. Many men will look at a job description and like, oh, I qualify for 50% of it, I'm gonna apply. Whereas women were like, oh, I don't qualify for 10% of the job description, I'm not even gonna apply, right? You, I mean, so many job descriptions, right? We've been through so many, even um, grant, I've been on, I used to work at the Townsend Center of Humanities at um, Berkeley, and so, you know, was part of privy to the grant um, uh, review process and uh, the fellowships, and I mean, there's just, so much random stuff that happens that you know you should never look at a description and not apply because a lot of times they don't even know what role they're trying to fill or what volume they're looking for, <laughs> right? We all know that, right? If you've been on the other side. Um, so those are some of the things that I would say, you know, I understand are the values that I provide in my current job and they're all things that I learned in the PhD program and I wouldn't regret a single day of what I did and, what I learned and the skills that I acquired both as part of my research and outside of my research. Yeah, I forgot about that imposter syndrome. <laughs> Which is a good thing, right? Because um, I came to a point where it wasn't true anymore. And it is true for most girls and most women in this, in this culture. Um, because we do think differently and we do have a different value set than what um, our male colleagues are taught as boys and then as men. So, but um, one of the things that, you know, you're talking about the thing, the skills that you develop is that, yes, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to get this project done, but I know from having done everything I had to do to get my doctorate, that I can figure it out, you know, so it doesn't leave me sitting in a place, I don't have to know everything and absolutely how to do it in order to proceed to figure out, you know, because I know what the, I want the outcome to be. But I know I'm kind of moving away from the question which was walking away from whatever. Um, and I have to say that walking away, I mean, it, you know, I can say it in a kind of this flip way, like, yeah, I got up and I packed. Well, I did, but that doesn't mean that I didn't have to sit with, how does this make me feel? What am I getting out of this position? Is it my ego that's involved? Or is it my heart that's involved? 
am I happy? What, what aspects am I happy with? What makes me unhappy? And I think that becomes the guide of when it's time to pack up and walk away. And you know, you'd say, well, did you walk away with another job? Did you walk, you know, sometimes we don't know what we're walking into. We're just walking away from what doesn't serve us. And that is not failure. That is making a decision. The same decision that whatever you were doing when you decided to enter into that PhD program, you walked away from something, right? I mean, it's the unusual person that goes from undergrad directly into grad school. Some of you have some life experience in between, and you had to make that decision to go into grad school. And it's often at a financial loss to walk away. But you walked away, and no one said, oh, you're a failure. You decided to go to grad school. <laughs> right? So when you walk away from these other things, whether you've chosen to leave a tenure-track job, whether you've chosen to leave a job that's you know, not paying or paying because your heart isn't there, because it's not feeding your soul, that's not failure. That is standing up and doing what the next thing is, what your next purpose is. Right? Nobody ever sits down when you go into grad school and say, what is your heart's desire? <laughs> did, it, did, anybody say, did anybody get that? <laughs> what do you really want to do? No, they're training you to be a faculty member. They're training you to be their replacement. But don't do it too quickly because if you start rising above them and you get noticed too much, then they're going to squash you. <laughs> right? So, but what is, so that, that's the question I'm posing to you all. What is your heart's desire? And some of you already know because you spent, spent some time with some introspection, and some of you are clueless. And clueless isn't bad, it just means you haven't sat with yourself long enough to think about it. And so is this track, your track, your choosing, or is it someone else outside forces kind of pushing you along. Do you come from an academic family? Mom and dad are PhDs and you become a PhD. I've met people like that and they were miserable, right? Because it wasn't their calling. It wasn't what they wanted to do in life. You know, so it is about looking at yourself and your desires and how you want to live in the world and if that means a tenure track position as a researcher or a faculty member, then you should go for it. You know, I don't want to discourage anybody. I know this is looking at the other side, right? But there are always multiple sides. And so if that is your heart's desire, you go for it and with, with abandon, just, right? But if it's not, take away the pressure of what other people think of you or want from you and ask yourself what you want for your life. Because I'm a firm believer in reincarnation, but we only get to remember one life at a time. And this is it. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're building, this is you and you're going to be passing it on to your friends, your family, the generations that come after you. What you do now affects everybody around you. So my way of approaching that is what is my what is my heart's desire and how am I going to fulfill that and when I fulfill that how am I going to give that to other people uh, hesitant to follow um, <laughs> you know, walking away I, uh, I was actually enjoying the best success of my my short young career when I decided to leave you know, it's been years trying to get published and didn't go well, and then I started getting these. I, I decided to leave because my husband had come to South Korea with me, and it's always tough for trailing spouses and expat spouses. Uh, also, the Republic of Korea does many things well, recognizing same-sex marriages is not one of them. And uh, you know, he'd been there for five years or four years when we had the talk, and he's like, "I'm I'm done. I followed you here. You know, if you get a work visa in another country, you very rarely get one for your spouse." And he was just bored and losing his mind. And he, he worked for Samsung, 
and he felt totally devalued. And so he said, yeah, I'm moving back to America. You can come or not. And uh, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, tenure track jobs are rare, but happy marriages are also rare. And I wasn't willing to, I didn't want to stay abroad forever. There's a shelf life for expats. If you live overseas, you'll see, you'll meet people, especially white men, who should have gone back to the US maybe 10 years before. Uh, because especially if you're a white male with a PhD from the United States, you occupy insane privilege. But it's also totally anonymous. So you're completely, un you're like an anonymous celebrity. It's just very, so I, I meet these guys, and you talk to me, and they're like, ooh, you've been here two years too long. Uh, and I, I wanted to get out ahead of that window. Because you know, the longer you stay in academia, the harder it is to transition to a non-academic job. The longer you stay in an expat community, the harder it is, I think, to reintegrate to just civilian life in the United States. Uh, so I didn't want to stay in Korea forever. Uh, my husband said, you moved us to Korea. I want to pick where we move next. And that was essentially why I pulled the plug on the academic job search, because <laughs> you have the audacity to have, a, to have a preference about where you live. You'll, you'll never get a job. And I thought, like, my friends with three books and a Harvard PhD aren't getting jobs. So I don't feel like, like, I, like take one person out of the labor market. I'll give the job to a friend. But I just started getting those, those acceptance letters from journals we hear about. They're like the, the editor wrote to me, like the week after I decided, and he said, this is fantastic, and I never do this, but we're not going to do a second round. Make these suggestions, and we're going for it. Like, if you spent years trying to get published in a tier one journal, or you know, I, was, I, I decided I was not staying in academia, and the next week, uh, Princeton offered to fly me down to Brisbane to give a public lecture at the Brisbane Gallery of Art, and I was on TV and all that, and I was like, oh. But, <laughs> you know, Life is complicated and messy, and I felt one window closing. And my, my director and my mentors were like, you are fucking crazy. You are, sorry for my language, but they, they said, you are leaving it. You, it is just starting to happen. And I thought, well, you know, it is what it is. And uh, I went, the, the day I decided that I was going to leave, I went to my, I love this story, I've already told it like five times today, but I went to my study and I looked at the bookcase of all the books that were going to be foundational for my book. And I, I said to my husband, I said, I'll have to mourn this. And I, I think it would have been a good book. But I, I went to my study and I looked at the shelf and I thought this is going to be a long day. And I looked at the shelf and I was like, okay. <laughs> and perhaps that demonstrates that I should never have taken this track because I lack that end all commitment to what, to what this line of work requires of you. But it also, I think, suggests a certain amount of flexibility that you read the writing on the wall. And uh, it was time. And I decided to get out while I was not, I think writing a book would have made me crazy. And I think, I think I would, because I'm too extroverted and I don't enjoy it enough, I think I would have ended up damaged by the process. And I thought, well, let's just do this now so I don't get denied tenure, or I don't get back to the United States and start over in Bismarck at a school that I don't love. And you know, maybe in six to nine years, I can maybe get back to the Bay Area. Uh, let's just do this now. And I was so lucky. I don't know if I believe in God, but these sorts of things I find convincing that a friend of mine from grad school had been hired by Zoho. And she said, well, we're looking for someone who can teach English to people who are working in their second language who doesn't mind long plane flights and six to eight weeks in Asia at a time. And so I just picked up and got into another job. And I had expected it to be so uh, devastating, and I expected a crisis of confidence and identity. And I'm like, mm, no. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful that I lucked, just rolled over so easier than your 401k. I rolled over and <laughs> So I think those sorts, of, those sorts of anxieties are to an extent optional. Uh, or you know, it, can be, it can be easy. And it's not for everyone. Like I said, the way I look at it now is I freed up space and I freed up a job for someone else who's more into it. Uh, so walking away was, was, was great. You know, I slept better that night. 
and I've slept better every night since. The one thing I do want to say, though, is it's not as if the, the, the academy is the only place where you can be driven insane, uh, figurative, figuratively or literally, by your colleagues, your managers, the C-level guys. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're insecure in academia, you'll be insecure in the business world or in the nonprofit sector. And many of these things are an inside job. And, you know, a little CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy or something, can be very helpful for many people. And I say this very honestly because we don't talk about this much. Uh, you know, it can be disastrous to your job if you admit that your mental health is not perfect. Uh, but a lot of these things, if they are something you need to attend to, you'll need to attend to it no matter where you are. So go ahead and do it while you have insurance and benefits, thanks to UAW. Uh, and uh, I can't remember what else. Uh, everything everyone else has said about your cover letter and why you are qualified for non-traditional academic employment is completely right. The one thing I would add is I read a lot of cover letters and resumes now from academics. Uh, many places, it is beneficial to leave off your credentials. I did it here just for practice. Uh, everyone's very happy you have a doctorate, but they really don't care. Um, also, don't, you know, in many places where you apply, don't talk about your research. And try not to sound like a professor or an academic, because you will unintentionally give the impression that you are still trying to be in two places at once. Um, yeah. No, and uh, that's it. On that, I shared with some people last night about that. So um, at Berkeley, they had a workshop called Beyond Academia, taught by I think his name is Steve Green, um, which was so helpful because one of the things he said is that if you put your PhD on your resume, you may, you may never get that first interview. Um, you know, some people I talked to last night, uh, if you are going to an area where you are using your expertise, especially like as a consultant or have you been, you know, that's perfectly fine. But in my case, like I made a complete switch. I thought about what they talked about in that workshop, um, and I just put that I graduated from Berkeley in the year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't write the degree. Um, at that moment, I think I panicked a little bit. In retrospect, what I would have done, and I think is valuable information, is just put that you have a master's. You don't have to say that you have a PhD. If you have a master's, um, it's fairly common. There's no stigma attached to it. But definitely for the job that the, my first job that I had outside of academia, I feel pretty convinced that if I had written that I had a PhD, I wouldn't have even gotten that interview because people, uh, you know, have uh, certain assumptions. And uh, so then I was in the closet about it for like seven, eight years, uh, and actually kind of terrified and felt stupid about it. And then when some people did find out, some people completely weighed down. I, so I felt it was justified to have been in the closet all those years because in positive and negative and crazy ways, people really respond strangely. And I'm talking in Silicon Valley where I was surrounded by like computer science PhDs and math and physics PhDs doing different things. So depending on you know where you are, I'm, I'm just talking about my own personal experience. But you know if you say you have a master's in something that's pretty generic and you can still say that your thesis was about whatever topic that you like. Um, but there's no need to do that. And then just to add to the, the walking away part, um, especially I think everybody in this room, very smart, very motivated, very passionate about things that you do. Whatever jobs you do end up in, if it's outside of academia, I'm sure it will be with similar, passionate, interesting, educated people um, that you know, you'll know you find your fit. And um, so my story is that when I shifted roles and then I finally joined this team where I knew I'd be doing more social media and be in a more public place, I felt, okay, it's just a matter of time that you know people are going to find out. And I had this opportunity to have a team offsite where we all had to give like a 10 minute talk because it was part of public speaking training. And I, I thought about that a lot. I just thought, well, this is the perfect time to do it. I'm just going to share this, what I do on evenings and weekends um, with my team. So I throw up a slide, a deck, and I, oh, so what I do is I, you know, I speak at film conferences, I publish, um, and I threw up a slide on cross-dressing in 
1970s Italian sex comedies. <laughs> and then I basically gave my dissertation pitch, you know, why Italy, why the 70s, you know, um, why sex comedies, uh, cultural, economic, legal, you know, all, all these things. And uh, I gave my 10 minute pitch. And uh, turned out my manager, manager, of course, oh, that's so interesting. I studied with Pierre Bourdieu. I read all of his books and I talked to him and I said, you know, I want to do a PhD with you and I love this blah blah. But I got this job offer in California and I don't know what to do. And Bourdieu told me personal advice from Bourdieu, <laughs> saying, Oh, you know, you should go do it. You should try it out. I'll always be here. You should always do that. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, and then I went to Google and that was the rest of it. So really, like the places you end up, you're gonna find that you're not even a snowflake. Right, like my manager has written more about you than me, so just imagine more imposter syndrome coming out of my workplace with like, as having my big reveal. Um, but uh, you know, so I feel like that's that's one part of it. You think you're walking away, but depending on where you end up, you might not be walking away at all. You're going to find out that you have so many other people around you do things. Um, and then another part of that is once you do reveal, or if it is appropriate to what you do. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who moved from France and didn't know how she was going to get a job here and all that. And she does fencing. She's like a competitive, you know, like national level fencer. Oh, but it doesn't apply to what I do. And I told her, I know this might be a little bit cynical, but um, being interesting is a commodity. <laughs> it really is. So whatever your story may be, you know, as long as you're authentic, and I'm sure everybody has passionate things that they do even outside of their academic work, um, a lot of that helps you. Like, when I gave this talk to my colleagues, one guy, in, for better or for worse, he said, you earned a lot of street cred that day. <laughs> what? <laughs> what was I before then, right? <laughs> but there are aspects to that, and as much as you feel like leveraging it, you know, you'll never really walk away.